Good afternoon and welcome to 67 Hail Hail Live. I'm your host John McGinley. Joining me today is Lewis Laird for a chat about Celtic and specifically about the Celtic B team and what they've been up to in the early parts of the season. I know there's um, not much going on with the Celtic first team at the moment. They've been on a bit of a holiday after their exertions in Sydney, returning to training next week, going off to Portugal. So we thought it was a good chance just to check in with the B team and no one better to do that than our very own Lewis who... Travels to most of the games, don't you, Lewis? Do you go you go home and off and away as well? Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, lonely that can sort of be anywhere across Scotland as well. You know, just up the road from here an hour away. But yeah, travel to most of the games. <laughs> yeah, and and what is the experience like of following Celtic B this season? What is it like going to these different grounds, seeing these different Lowland League teams? Is is it enjoyable? Is it something that you do because you feel like you have to cover it, or is it something that you do out of choice because you're you're having such a good time? No, I do enjoy it, you know, I like to get to, obviously a Celtic fan, but I like to get to different grounds and stuff as much as possible, you know, especially during this time of the World Cup, you know, there's no sort of football in, in, in the top of Scotland anyway, so it's good to go out and visit these grounds and I feel like so when the Celtic B thing started up, it was maybe a Celtic that's not covered as much, so I thought, why not give it a go and try and share the coverage goals, and it seems to have gone well over the past like, 18 months and just continue through there. Yeah, and... And it's been, it's kind of been a period of change for the B team. You know, I think a lot of people maybe look at the results. We're currently seventh in the Lone League table, I believe, having games in hands with most of the teams above us. Some of the results haven't quite gone our way this season. UEFA Youth League didn't quite go our way this season. But generally, you know, are you seeing good football? Are you seeing what you kind of want to see from, from this group of young players? It's been quite a strange season, you know, because obviously the Lone League started beginning of August or something and it was a bit of an inconsistent start to that you know I don't think they got a strung together two wins in the league until late August so there was a few slip ups here and there and it's almost felt as though they've not been in more league action in recent months because they've had so much on with the youth league I think there was a period of like a month that was, there was no game and stuff like that so it has been a bit of a strange season there's been some results that you look at and you think geez oh because obviously I think last month being 40 off Cumberland Colts even the past weekend four each with Caledonian players, but at the same time, I think there has been sort of mitigating circumstances of that, you know, obviously there's games they have slipped up and they would admit it's not been good enough, but the, during some of these games like Saturdays, it's actually been a good performance and I think you'll find, you know, Danny Day and Steve McMahon are so saying press conferences and post-match interviews, obviously it'd be frustrating to lose so many goals and, and lose games, but it is all about performance and development and you don't lose these games, you, you learn from them. So mm-hmm. it's, it's a big learning curve for the players and they continue to learn this system in training and, and during games. And do you see do you see similarities between the way the B team are playing and the first team? And I've seen the B team on a handful of occasions this year, um, maybe two or three times at, at the most. And you do get the sense that they're trying to use, you know, some inverted fullback play. You do get the sense that they're trying to play a lot of possession-based football and, and really take the game to teams. Do, do you feel like there's been more of a synergy as times developed over Ange Postecoglou's reign? Is it more noticeable this season? What's the kind of vibe on how, how well, you know, the the style of the 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 play of the team? Yeah, so obviously it sort of kick started last season. We would see bits bits and pieces here and there, but I feel so when we've come into this season, you know, it's been mentioned we've started training up at Lennox Town. And, Obviously, the introduction of Steve McMahon, who has worked so closely with Ange and the first team last season. So, you have started to see it a lot more this season, particularly with sort of the fullbacks, underlapping runs and stuff. You know, except the supporters, they'll be used to that with the first team. And it's something that has grown in prominence um, over the past 18 months. You know, dominating much of the ball, that's expected at Celtic, and they've done that in the World League. It's just about learning how to do that and learning how to play Ange's system, which, as I mentioned, you have, you have seen more of this season, I think. So we've got some questions from viewers that I put to Twitter early in the week to kind of ask you, you know, specific questions about some of the B team. Oh. But before we do that, I just want to talk a bit about the change as well from Tommy McIntyre to Dan O'Dea and Stephen McManus, because that was a kind of big thing in the summer. Harry Keel came mm-hmm. in and the chat was that, you know, Stephen McManus was moving over to the B team, taking on co, you know, almost head coach duties with Dan O'Dea. Do you feel like it was the right time for a change? You know, Tommy McIntyre was there for so long and was almost synonymous with the young group of Celtic players. He's obviously moved on now to Queen's Park, but 
you know, what, what were your feelings around that change and and why and maybe how it came about? Is it more about developing Dan O'Day and Stephen McManus or was it just time for a change for these players, you know, after having a coach in place for so long? Yeah, it did come as a, a bit of a surprise seeing Tony McGumpy has been here for sort of upwards of 15, 14 years. And uh, obviously last season that he took the B team, you expected that such a speed pace going into the, um, this season, sort of last year. But when the news that Harry Field was coming in, it sort of raised the question what is happening with, with Stephen McManus and stuff. And then subsequently it followed that he was joining the B team. So it probably was a change that was sort of needed to, to freshen things up a wee bit. And obviously Tommy's now undoing um, Queen's Park, as you mentioned. but it's, it's been a good opportunity for Steve McManus to develop himself as a coach and Dan O'Day. I think you've noticed that changes in the, in the sidelines because last season Tommy McIntyre was more the prominent figure and just watching Steve McManus and Dan O'Day in the sidelines, you can see they've got their roles, you know, O'Day's more the one who's talking to the players and McManus is more of a relaxed figure in the sidelines and you even see that in, in their, maybe like there was a player in a sense, but you see it from the press rooms and stuff and it, it's been good to get that presence, even as an example of what it's like you know, you can't really get many, but two examples and players have risen through the academy. Mike Manus has went on to captain the club, but he's also got that experience with the first team training every day and he'll bring it over, hopefully, to, to the squad. Yeah, I think it's been a positive change, you know, from my perspective. It just felt like maybe, you know, people set, settle into their ways almost when someone is in a role for so long, is in, you know charge of something so long I think sometimes taking a fresh look at things is good and I think you know Dan O'Day and Dan and the, the really talk about you know Ange's almost oversight role you know Ange isn't involved on on a day-to-day basis with the B team but Dan's described it as a kind of director of football role almost in, in terms of overseeing the B team ensuring that you know there are decisions made on players when decisions do need to be made, you know, kind of having an oversight of, you know, as we're saying, you know, enacting a style of football that would be consistent with um, the first team. Also training more at Lennox Town, I believe, this season. Mm. Yeah, that's correct, yeah. It's uh, stuff that needs to come, you know, when I just came in, there was so much change, so it felt as a, as a natural next step to, to introduce guys like um, Dan Steen to this coach, no, but yeah, no, that, that step to move to Lennox Town is one that was probably needed in terms of being able to match the first team if you want to integrate that, that system which they have. Yeah, I think that's obviously a positive because I think, that, you know, the, the more that they're training up beside the senior side, the more chance Andrew's got to to keep an eye on on someone who is impressing in training. I think, and I, I'd heard before that change had happened that some people close to the players, the young players, were wanting more interaction at Lennox Town and, and more opportunities to train up there. And that was maybe seen as a problem. And I, I know over the last few years, we've seen a lot of young players leave the club, unfortunately, and mm-hmm. um, for all sorts of reasons, you know, um, some maybe at the club's end, some maybe just, just for the players, you know, own personal ambitions. Um, do you feel like Celtic are, are kind of addressing those issues now? It's definitely a step in the right direction, you know. Obviously, it is frustrating. To, I know how frustrating it is, you know, watching players like Ben Book, who featured for the B team last year, go and play for Liverpool. In, in one hand, I mean, a club like Liverpool, in this day and age, it's going to be hard to turn that sort of thing down. But you can see that Celtic are taking those steps in the right direction to try and fix that. And it may not come right away, you know, we've seen even players leave this year, players go to Leeds, and it will still be frustrating. But you feel as though it's a, a long term thing that will come into place with time, and that, that is needed to. To let it fall into place. Yeah, um, we're going to run through some questions here um, that I put out earlier in the week. Um, some specific to a couple of players. One question here, you know, from Craig says that you know the same boys, the same <coughs> young players seem to be mentioned on Twitter all the time, and I'm assuming he's talking about Rocco Vata, Ben Summers, perhaps Boson Lawwell. They certainly seem to be the 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 most hyped players at the moment or the most the most talented players from the B team at the moment. Craig's wanting to know who do you see kind of under them progressing that might be more underdogs or might not be as mentioned as often as, as you know, the, the Vatas, the Summers, the, the Lawwells? Yeah, there's also a few standouts and I think maybe one who's, he did feature in, in pre-season in one game, sort of first 
pre-season games, that was Matthew Anderson, who's actually gone on to, to captain the B-side this season. You know, uh, he's a left-back, wearing number 63, so, <laughs> but no, he's, he's been impressive. Last season, he found he was playing a bit part role because he, he was injured at the start of the season and he was starting to sort of slowly be integrated, but this season we've seen him sort of more regular, you know, as I say, captain the side in the lower league and the AFL Youth League. He's got a brilliant delivery in his left foot, so it's, we've got a sort of history for raising fullbacks. So hopefully, he'd be the next one. You know, another player who's featured in pre season, Josh Teddy, who's not maybe had as much of a role in, in the B team this season, but he is only 16 and he looks like a talented player. So, you'd hope that this new sort of introdu- introduction sorry, of um, all that's been brought to the club would help raise his profile as he is going as a younger player as well. And just on the more mentioned players, Stephen's asking, does Lewis think Rocco Vata and Ben Summers have a chance of breaking into the first team squad this season? Well, Lewis could certainly, I'd say, be the stand be the standout in the, the B team, particularly Rocco, you know. And we've seen that with him heading to Australia with the first team, he's obviously getting rewarded for it, but they're both very talented players and you've seen that not only in the Lone League DA for recently, playing against some of the extra academy sides and well, you know, Real Madrid, Derby Leipzig and they're impacting on the game, Rocco scoring and in, in a win over Abbey Leipzig. So those two probably are the standout that get mentioned, as, you, as you've said, and the, arguably the best chance of making it with the first team. You know, as we mentioned a few times, Rocco was in Australia, but Ben Summers was also supposed to be going to Australia, but he picked up an injury just before, which is unfortunate for his timing, but you'd hope that would be sound for the future that I'm just hopeful he can, can join the group. As I've kind of said on the channel before, it does feel like maybe three or four of the players are kind of at another tier towards the rest of the B team. Is that a fair assessment? It feels like maybe like you're Vata, you've got Summers, you've got Anderson probably, who you've, who you've just mentioned yourself, and then Boston Lowell. They seem to be the, the kind of three or four that have the best chance of making the first team at the moment. And I've said before, you know, it's unrealistic for to expect the entire B team to come into the first team squad. But if you can get three or four players you know, every couple of years, then I think that's a really good hit rate. And that's something that we need to kind of ramp up again. I feel like we did kind of get that going maybe about a decade ago. It's kind of dropped off again. Um, but I would love to see some of these players coming through. And, you know, I'd really like the look of Vata. I think he's really direct and really forward thinking. Summers just has lovely balance, that kind of midfield mm-hmm. look about him that you love to see in, in a Celtic midfielder. Um, so there, there's plenty and you know another one who hasn't been mentioned for a while is, is Dane Murray and I think you know he was certainly one you know one of those crop that you would consider to be um, part of that kind of elite little group within the Celtic B group and he's had a serious injury season is that right and do we know if he's going meant to be making a return soon or or, or what kind of injury you know how long that will keep him out for? Yeah, so he, sat, he suffered a serious injury back in sort of April uh, in one of the Lone League games. And unfortunately, you could tell straight away, it was at the game, you could tell straight away it was one of those, you know, um, knee injuries. And unfortunately, he's, he's, he suffered that. But he seems to do, I think he was back running um, a few weeks ago at Linux Town. So that is a positive sign, but I'm not sure he'd be able to make a season or any time soon. He'd hopefully maybe at some point next year, but I don't expect that he'd be making a return sort of any time soon. It's come at such an unfortunate time as well, you know, looking in the summer, it seemed as though it was just Stephen Welsh and Cameron uh, Carter Vickers, you obviously had Julian and, and the world feature a little bit as well um, in pre-season, but with staff at injured, it felt like it would have been a good opportunity for somebody like Dean Murray to step in alongside Lowell and, and try and get some minutes in the first team in pre-season, but it's come at such an unfortunate time. Hopefully he can um, work on his recovery and be back in time for, for this year's pre-season. Alex is asking, does Ange ever attend, actually attend any of the games? Have you seen him sitting beside you in, in the stand, Lewis and Airdrie? Unfortunately, I've not seen him at Airdrie. Um, I believe he's been to one game, and that was the, the Rangers game at Celtic Park. But this, it's maybe I've not seen it as much this season, but last season in particular, there was a lot of representation from the first team. You know, John Kennedy was there regularly, Steve McManus at the time, and Gavin Strachey making appearances. But unfortunately, no appearances of Ange Postacoglu at the Celtic Stadium. <laughs> I'm sure he'll be turning up perhaps for that one at Celtic Park towards the mm-hmm. end of next month. Um, if you've missed that, Celtic announced yesterday that um, the Celtic versus Rangers home derby on Celtic's behalf um, in the Lowland League will be taking place at Celtic Park. It's an opportunity for fans to get down and support the team for you know the coaching staff to, to show support for the team as well. So that's it always feels like a big moment when they get to play in the big stadium with us. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, no, it was it was a bit disappointing the result last year, but it was a fantastic occasion. And it was a good turnout at Celtic Park. It'd be good to see another big um, turnout this time. You know, a derby game, maybe not the first team derby, but the one underneath we'll, we'll try and get a good turnout for that. And it's fantastic for the players to learn from that experience and, and for the future. And you get all the Celtic B part timers, not like you, the diehard. Going to the <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the part timers pick up the tights for that one. <laughs> um, Ewan's asking, how valuable do we think it is for the team to play in the UEFA Youth League and against the Premier League academies? They're obviously taking part in that Premier League and the National Cup this season as well. A lot, of, a lot of tournaments this season, Lewis. It seems like a more diverse kind of you know, run through for, for a lot of the players, you know, and a lot of them ov- obviously go off and play youth international football as well. Seems like an awful lot of matches. How How is your experience of the youth, UFA Youth League and, and how does it compare to kind of say the Lowland League? Obviously, I think most people would assume or have the assumption that the Lowland League's pretty physical. Um, was the UFA Youth League you, you notably a different style against... Leipzig, Madrid, and Shakhtar. You went to a couple of the away games as well, didn't you? The, some of their academies. Yeah, just the one I went to Germany for Leipzig picked a good one because that was the, the one victory we got in the UEFA Youth League. So, but it's definitely been good to have that experience of different compositions. You know, the UEFA Youth League and then there's the Premier League International Cup. Even the SK Phil Trust Trophy that's faced sort of League Two, League One opposition is has been a good experience. Darren Dane, Steve McManus have mentioned before it's potentially easier to match up in these UEFA Youth League games because. You, you know, these academies are going to set up to be on the front foot. These top teams want to win games, whereas in the Lone League can do that more of a, a mix. But playing against some of these, the, the Real Madrid's and the RB Leipzig was a fantastic experience. Going into it, I wasn't sure, I wasn't sure what to expect, to be honest. You know, I wasn't sure whether it would be too much. But I was actually pleasantly surprised at, at the levels we did reach. It, it doesn't maybe look as good when you've got the two Real Madrid results, you know, the first one sort of losing 5 0. But again, I think there's context to that, you know. We had a man set off after, well, it was quite early, and but they'd actually put in quite a good performance up to that point. And mm-hmm. I'm not saying they got in, but it was it was good to see them matching the levels and, and putting their input in the game. And I think they did that in almost all of the UFA Youth League games, even though they only won one game. But the RB Leipzig away was also a highlight because they were able to, to win that game away from home, and it was a really impressive show. But it has been a great opportunity to feature in these games. And a quick shout out to you and ask a question who's a regular at these weekends as well. Nice, nice. Um, the Real Madrid game I watched, it was on BT Sport, and it was crazy because the weather was one of the most ridiculous yes. bouts of weather I've ever seen at a football game for a while, actually. You know, when you turn on the TV um, and it just looks ridiculous that they're even playing in it, it seemed to be a, a, a cyclone storm just swarming over the stadium at that point. Exactly. It was just, I thought it was getting called off, honestly. Yeah, yeah, it was like... It was like um, when the F1 and they pull out the super wet tyres and go behind the safety car, mm-hmm. that's what I needed that day. Um, and it, it was like that for for a while. And Celtic gave as good as they got in those those first 20 minutes or so, and then it all kind of just went downhill from there. But I thought it was such an exciting start to the game and a good to see the young team really go at Real Madrid that day. And, and that gave me a bit of encouragement because obviously, as we saw from the senior side, they did exactly the same in the group stage. And mm-hmm. um, sadly, to, to similar results in terms of, of how the group panned mm-hmm. out. Lewis, something that a lot of people say, you know, perhaps the tractors of the Lowland League experiment say it's probably not a high enough level for our most talented players to kind of play their football. What do you think is next for for your Vatas, for your Lowells? Is, you know, another half season in the Lowland League right for them? Or would you like to see them head out on perhaps a development loan somewhere? Maybe a team in the Scottish Championship? Maybe even the lower, lower Scottish Premiership? Maybe English lower leagues? Is that the right route for them, or is it better t- for you? Do, do you think to stay, you know, embedded within this group, stay training at Lennox Town, and just basically wait for their opportunity in the first team? I can see why people have got their types with the Lone League. You know, it's a, it's quite a different league. You know, it's still sort of come together, and there's all sorts of different levels. But I think there is some good um, stuff in there. You know, we're looking at University of Stirling. They've reached the fourth round in the Scottish Cup, and they played Dundee and Tandy, beating to a League Two side. So I think. The Lone League can be a good product for maybe a younger person sort of between 16 and 19 a push, but when you can see players like Vata pushing through, the next step might be best for Lone. I think the best example of that is Lowell this season. You know, he was a standout last season, but I feel as though now he's got to the stage where a Lone would be best because he's coming in and out of the side with the 
you really found this league and even Toby Leone has obviously been mentioned of other one in, in January. We've seen Johnny Kenny who featured towards the back end of last season go out alone to a Scottish Championship side. So I think there definitely is a use for the loan league, you know, maybe the younger ages and then it comes to the next step where, where a loan would be valuable. I would like to see a loan for Vata, I think. I think maybe getting a run of games under his belt would be beneficial for him. I think, you know, from what I hear, Rokova is desperate to play to be a Celtic player and desperate to play for Celtic in the long term, you know, despite all the rumours about teams being interested in him, etc. And I think if we can really get him a good loan somewhere and maybe get him to build towards making a first-team impact next summer and, and maybe next season, I think that would be, be a real help and... I th- another question from Craig here is kind of on that subject. It, it, it says, you know, he says that Ange keeps ba- buying kind of younger players um, and he's, he's doing so again in January in terms of Kobayashi coming in instead of maybe giving Lawwell a chance. And he's questioning whether he thinks Ange has faith in the current crop or that faith in the current Celtic youth system. What's your assessment of that? It just I'll just answer that briefly of, of my views on it and is it in that, you know, I feel like Ange is making sure that the first team group is strong enough and perhaps that some of the young players at the moment are still trying to reach a level that he has set. Um, I don't think it necessarily means he doesn't have faith in bringing youth players through, but I do think the jury is out on whether you know the current crop can make it into into the standards that Ange has set. And I think we'll, you know when Ange first came in, he was almost firefighting and, and trying to build the team on, on the fly, basically. This season, he was obviously trying to push them to a Champions League level. I think maybe over the next six to 12 months, we'll see if actually young players are going to start getting an opportunity in this team. But I don't think we should say that Ange doesn't have faith, but I do think the jury is out on whether he's going to start introducing youth players into this team. Do you think that's fair? What what do you think? You know, there's a lot of perception about the way Ange, you know, has the young players and perhaps doesn't use the homegrown talents. But it feels like they're knocking on the door a wee bit, doesn't it? Yeah, no, I think that's a very fair assessment. You know, I can see why people would think that you bring a 32-year-old and maybe blocking off the pathway of, of a younger player. But at the same time, I think it will come with time as well. You know, seeing these these moves made to, to introduce to try and introduce the the B team to the first team. So hopefully, with more time, that that can play its its part in helping them make their way through. It might be the fact that younger players maybe like Sir. Anderson or a young Daniel Kelly who's only 16 years old it might not be until they're coming through that we might see that but I, th- I think it definitely is about um, giving Ange time to to show that he, he will give players that faith and hopefully we see like, like a, a little bit of you know movement or a little bit of progression and in some sense you know even whether it is moving out on loan or whether they get another opportunity in Portugal or, or what, what the story is or whether they start to get more opportunities in the back half of the season. It'll be very interesting to see where it all goes from here, Lewis. Lewis, we'll probably catch up with you in a few months and, and get your thoughts on how it's going then. But first, you're off to see Celtic bonus United, Celtic B bonus United tonight, is that right? Yeah, that's correct. Probably need to wrap up again because it's starting to get freezing in December, you know. Whereas the first team's not on perfect opportunity to get along and, and see the B team at Chelsea Stadium if you can. I've been to Bowness United before, believe it or not. Um, I used to live in Lithgow and Bowness was just mm-hmm. down the road um, and I visited there one time. Interesting. Interesting these teams going up against Celtic B. I, I, I kind of like it, um, but, but we'll see how it pans out. I think Celtic mm-hmm. B, they'll be pushing towards the top of the table. I know they're seventh at the moment. They've got you know a couple of games in hand on teams in sixth to second. Is that right? Mm-hmm. And then Rangers are five yeah, points ahead. Yeah, but even if they win their two games in hand, they should go second, but obviously... Ranger in front of the minute. Oh, we'll see how it goes. Well, thanks for joining us, everyone. Um, we'll get Lewis on again. We'll we'll chat about the Celtic B team. If you haven't had the opportunity to go and see Celtic B, I would recommend it and recommend staying in touch with the team. Celtic posts regular highlights to the YouTube channel. You can hear regularly from Darren O'Day and Stephen McManus and in interviews and fan media press conferences that Lewis, you often attend as well. So it is easier than ever to keep track of the Celtic youth team and the Celtic B team. Um, and hopefully, you know, we when we're checking in a couple of months and check out how they're doing, um, things are moving along positively. For now, we'll say goodbye, and I'll also say good luck to Australia, who are kicking off in about half an hour's time in their big World Cup match against Denmark. 
Um, congratulations to the Celtic players who are doing so well at the World Cup at the moment. Cameron Carter-Vickers in particular, who's through to the last 16 and thought was superb against Iran last night. Um, but Hamish will be back on the channel tomorrow answering your questions in the Q&A. And then he'll be back next week from his holiday, getting back down to the usual day-to-day -day videos in 6-7 Hail Hail. Thanks for joining us at the moment. Thanks for joining us, Lewis. Enjoy your, your time tonight at Celtic Bonus. Thank you. I'm to get back to my <laughs> Cheers, everyone. Catch you later.